everybody. How are you doing, Dr. Train? Good, how are you? Sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that time. You have a lot of, uh, lot of midterms? Yeah, I have two this week. Oh man, one of one of them is for me. I know. Yeah, one of them for you. <laughs> yeah, there's four. There's four seventy six there. Four seventy six is that that's senior design, right? No, four seventy six is the oh, this the, lab. The, the lab. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. I feel like I'm writing a research paper every time. Or like a publishing a research paper. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't know much about the labs here. I, I, I mean, I know that they exist, but all the classes I teach are either lecture based or, or computational based, and so I haven't really stepped stepped foot in any of those labs. It's um, uh, I mean, it's it's cool. Uh, I think uh, this is the first. This is only the second lab I've done in person. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Virtual labs are just, I don't know. That, that should be illegal, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it seems like a paradox to have a lab, but virtually. So you can't even touch the equipment or, or, or do anything with it. Yeah. How was your weekend? No, oh, it was good. Yeah, it was a uh, it was chill. I I got to chill at home a lot, but my my wife is uh, she's working on her design portfolio so that she can um, transition to another job. So yeah, she was working on that most of the weekend. So I got to cook and clean and and do all that stuff. But it's always nice. It's always nice to have have days like that or weekends like that. Thanks. Quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you see how this whole number two is on rollers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that just mean that your u two of x is free, and your u two of y is constrained? Here? Exactly. Yeah. So all the for each time you go one to two or. Yep. Two to three, two to four. Yep. Okay. I mean, this whole problem is one B, so you would only get uh, oh, yeah. X, okay. X, because these are all trusses. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Are we continuing the time marching notes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. 
How was your weekend, Dr. Tran? Yeah, weekend was good. Uh, I got to stay in. I got to stay in for most of the weekend because my, my wife is working on her design portfolio. She's uh, hoping to transition to another job. So, uh, so we just kind of, I mean, I, I stayed at home and I chilled. So I did oh, laundry, nice. did cooking, did some cleaning. Oh, we had a, we had a big roach problem actually. So I, I dealt with that over the weekend actually. <laughs> we had a, I mean, we've, we've had, we've had roaches in our apartment for a while, but um, just a ton of them came out to, came out to party on, on Friday night. I think I killed like 12, like 12 big roaches and like maybe like a few dozen tiny roaches that day, that night. Oh, dang. It was crazy. Yeah. I emptied out, I emptied out. I mean, I, I didn't know how much was left, but I had a bottle of Raid uh, roach spray. And so I just sprayed that kind of everywhere in my kitchen and it, it smoked a lot of them out. So I just kept, I, I literally smooshed roaches for like an hour on Friday night. <laughs> oh man, that sucks. Yeah. But, you know, I bought a bunch of stuff. I went to Home Depot, got a bunch of roach traps and roach sprays. And so they haven't, I haven't seen any since then, but um, I know, I know probably they, the, the apartment has to fumigate if they want to really get rid of it. But yeah. I heard you're not supposed to uh, smush roaches because the eggs live in their body. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, man. So when you when you smash them, they uh, release their eggs. Oh, That's why you keep having roach problems. Oh, yeah, I <laughs> you gotta, you gotta <laughs> make sure you destroy them completely, though. I usually I, uh, I usually just catch it and flush it down the toilet. I see. I see. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll have to do that from now on. Do they sound crunchy? I I, I maybe. I mean, I was using I was I, I was using a paper towel when I when I was smooshing them. I mean, some were bigger than than other ones, but uh, that's that's good to know. I won't uh, I won't smush them anymore. I'll just, I'll just catch them and flush them. Might have yeah. to sprinkle some diatomaceous earth around uh, wherever they're hiding. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm pretty sure they're behind my dishwasher. That's that's where most of them were coming out from, and so I just you know. I, I wasn't able to take out the dishwasher, but I, I at least got into the space behind it and I just sprayed as much of the raid as, as I could. And so hopefully, hopefully that got him out of them, but we'll see. Raid doesn't even help. They don't need this. Like they're immune to it uh. <laughs> well, from my experience, but I see. like, I'll tell you for sure. Like uh, when we had a big roach problem, like I think like five years ago and then I, and then someone told me about the not smushing the roaches. And ever since then, our roach uh, problem like went down a lot. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll have to try that. Uh, Dr. Tran, I do have a question regarding the homework. Yep. Mm -hmm. When it comes to convection uh, 2D problems, uh, if we decide to do upwinding, are we free to choose either forward or backward or like mix between both? Or are we locked into using only one, like only forward and backward throughout the entire thing? Yeah, it, it, uh, it, it depends. So, um, so actually someone came up with a good question about this um, on, on the homework, actually. So, I mean, which... Which whether you use forward or backward difference, it, it depends on the direction of the velocity. And so if the velocity is positive, then you use backward difference. Okay, but if the velocity is negative, then you use forward difference. Um, but if you're going to use upwinding on one of the convection derivatives, you should use it, you should use it on both. Um, and so I think on the homework, there's one velocity which was unstable, it was like 65, but then the other yeah. one was stable. Um, and so usually you, you usually don't want to use, cause you know, even though both convection terms, they're separate derivatives, they're still the same phenomenon. And so you want right. to use the same, you want to use the same scheme for both. And so ideally if, if you can use central difference for both, 
And so they'd both be second order accurate. That would be the most ideal. Uh, but if you have to switch to upwinding on one, you should use upwinding on the other. So they're both they both have the same order of accuracy. That's the most consistent thing to do. Right. Okay. That's how uh, I tackle that problem. So then uh, for that one, it was best to apply both um, backward and forward on their Correct. respective velocities. Okay. Correct. Yeah. All right. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So what? Oh no. Oh, okay, so clarifying. We we don't use we don't use uh both. We only use we want to pick one or the other to use. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, yeah, mm -hmm. That's all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And so it depends on the the origin of the velocity. That's what that's when you should use a forward or backwards. Okay. It's five thirty. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, so first of all, first of all, uh, you know, let me start off the class. I I, I made. I made a ton of mistakes on the on last homework solutions and, and I know I caused a lot of confusion over the weekend so I just want to apologize for that so I'm you know I was you know not not to make any excuses you know I mean there is no excuse I I, I should have been I should have been better on it but uh, um, you know there was there was kind of a lot I was preparing this homework assignment while kind of preparing a lot of other stuff but you know but that's but that's no excuse you know I should be you know sh I should be doing better and so you know I'm gonna I, and so I apologize for that and you know um, cause you know, I got a lot of questions over the weekend and you know, it's, it's, sh it shouldn't be like that. You know, it should, you guys, you guys should be able to rely on the solutions that I provide you. Um, you know, and, and, you know, when I, when I make so many mistakes like that, it makes it hard. So, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, what's up, what's up? No worries. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I see, I see. Uh, especially right before the midterm, and so I and, and so I think that's like the worst time to do it because I know everyone's really stressed about the homework in the midterm, and you know I don't I don't want to cause any extra stress. So, um, and so you know I, I you know um, I'll I'll do better. That's this. Okay, and so um, today is it possible to extend the homework due date? And unfortunately, not because the because uh, the exam is going to be um, testing on on the homework stuff. And so I want to make sure that I can get the homework solutions to you guys. And so I have to have it due tonight um, so that I can post the solutions, um, you know, later tonight too, because I want you to have the solutions for all three homeworks so that you can use it to study for, for the exam. So yeah, norm, normally, normally I am, I am pretty flexible on when homeworks do, are due, but I need to have this one due tonight so I can give the solutions. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and so the, um, just like I mentioned, the, the midterm is Wednesday. And so, uh, you know, make sure you guys are, are here for that. And so I, I think I sent on Friday, I sent the, uh, an announcement for the, um, I had the review video, I had the study guide. And so hopefully that will help you guys uh, study. Okay. Uh, and I know the homework is kind of due right before, but, you know, doing, doing this homework, I, this homework in particular, I think is great practice for the exam. Because uh, problem two on the last homework is basically exactly what I'm going to expect you to do. Because the exam is is there's going to be no MATLAB on the exam. Um, it's all just going to be the theory. And so what I'm going to give you is basically differential equations, and I'm going to expect you to uh, produce the algebraic equations for them. Okay. Um, and so you know I, I kind of timed that kind of exactly that. So and so if you if you can do problem two uh, on the homeworks with the with the updated solutions, um, you know you're in you're in really good shape for the exam. Okay. All right, and so, uh, but today we're going to do something different. And so today we're going to be continuing on with our lecture from Wednesday, which was on time marching schemes. Okay, so today, today, you know, I think last time we went over a lot of the theory for explicit Euler, and so today we'll um, see it implemented in MATLAB. Um, and so I've, I have a few MATLAB scripts to show you guys, and then we'll start talking about implicit Euler, which is the the other method for for time marching schemes. Okay. All right, and so I, I think uh, I think that's all my announcements. So, are, are there any questions on anything before we get started? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and, and pick up where we left off. Okay. So where we left off last time was talking about explicit Euler. And so, just as a refresher, you know, this explicit Euler method is a way to solve unsteady problems. And by unsteady problems, what I mean are problems that have this time derivative term just like that. Okay. And you know, we went we went through kind of the full derivation last time, but let me just kind of summarize the steps here um, you know, for you. Okay. And so the first step is to take the time derivative. Okay, and we're going to discretize. 
And we're going to discretize it with forward difference. And so what we say is that partial phi partial t is going to be equal to phi uh, i at n plus one minus phi i at n all divided by delta t. Okay. Where remember, you know, since now that we're dealing with time, we have a separate index for time rather than space. Okay. And so the index for time here is in the is in the exponent. That's why for both of these, you see that their, their space index is still i, but their time index is n plus one in n, okay? Okay, step two to applying implicit, explicit Euler is to uh, discretize all the spatial derivatives just as we normally would. And so the diffusion derivative, we're going to use our central difference scheme for that. The convection derivative, um, you know, you can use either a central difference scheme or an upwinding scheme, depending on, um, you know, depending on the Peckley number. Okay, uh, but you have to add one extra thing, and so the extra thing has to do with this time index. Okay. And the time index that you're going to specify for all those spatial terms is just n. Okay. And so, as an example, you know, we take our second, we take our um, diffusion term, right? Okay. So we partial squared phi partial x squared. And so normally we discretize it like this. Right. So that's our normal diffusion um, derivative, um, you know, finite difference approximation. But in addition, we're going to take all the phi terms and assign it a time index of n. Okay, so you're just going to add an n to um, you know, to that. Right. And so once you once you've done steps one and two, all of the derivatives in your in your equation should be discretized, and so you shouldn't have any derivatives left, and so it should all be algebra. And so step three is to sim is to simplify the equation and solve for phi n plus one. Okay, you should only have one of these in the equation, and so you should only have one that comes from the time derivative. And then everything else um, gets moved to the right hand side of the equation. Okay. okay. And so by doing and so by doing this, you get you get an expression that looks like this. Okay. And so your resulting expression looks like the following. So you have phi i n plus one, and so we have that on one side of the equation. Okay. Next, you have A, which is your matrix coefficients multiplied by phi i n, okay? Okay, and we have plus B. And so this is the form of the equation that you should get whenever you implement an explicit Euler, okay? And this is gonna be true in 1D and 2D. And so after we go over implicit today, we're, we're gonna start to do a 2D problem with explicit Euler, okay? And you're gonna see we get the exact same format, okay? It's just gonna be a lot bigger because it's in 2D. So let me go ahead and label all these. And so, and so phi i um, at n plus one, this is the solution at the next time step. Right. So that's unknown. And so we, and so, you know, that's what we're solving for. 
This VI at N, this is the solution at the current time step. This A right here is our matrix of coefficients. Okay. And this B here is usually, I, I call this the extra terms, you know, anything that's kind of extra that's not uh, included in the, uh, um, you know, in the fees. But usually what goes over here are like source terms and boundary conditions. Okay. 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 And so the way and so the way this works is that you you start you start with a known solution for phi. And so remember, you start we start with our initial conditions, which are which are usually given to us, and then we just apply this equation just kind of over and over and over. Okay. And so first we we plug in our initial conditions for phi i at n. We multiply by our, our coefficients matrix and we get a new solution. Okay. Then that new solution is plugged into here in the next time step. And so, you know, we kind of just repeat this process over and over and over again until we reach, you know, until we reach the end of the simulation. Okay. All right. So that's, so that was a recap of, of where we were or, or kind of the recap of how explicit oil works. And so, are there, are there any questions on, on any of this? Okay. Okay, and so uh, specifically, we were we were left up, we were doing an example. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat the the entire example, but I, I do want to give you some context for it again. Okay? And so the example we were solving was the following. Okay? So our example was a simple unsteady diffusion. Okay, so we have partial phi partial t is equal to three partial squared phi partial x squared. And then our boundary conditions get two. So we have phi at x is equal to zero for all times t is equal to one. Okay. And we had a Neumann condition at the other end, d phi dx at x is equal to one for all times t is equal to two. Okay. And our initial condition was all zeros. Okay? And so phi at x at t is equal to zero. We're going to assume it starts at all, all zeros. Okay? All right. And so after we applied explicit Euler to this uh, equation, we end up with the following uh, matrix. Okay? And this is for five, five grid points. Okay. And so on the left-hand side, we have all our phi, uh, phi i's at n plus one. Okay, so we have phi one, two, three, four, five for each of the five grid points that we have, okay. Then we have our coefficient matrix. And so we have our coefficient matrix. And so that involves, you know, the 4.8s and the negative 8.6s. And then we multiply by the known solution at the given time. And then we add our B vector, which is the, the source terms and the boundary conditions. And so, um, 
you know, and so last time we were, I was showing you how to, how this kind of works in, in practice, right? And so we, we ran through the first couple of time steps and how that works. And today I'm, today I'm going to show you the, the MATLAB implementation of this, um, you know, just, just to kind of illustrate some, some issues. All right. Any questions on this before we, we jump into the MATLAB? You, you guys should have these coefficients in your notes from last time. So, um, you know, I just wanted to write it again, just for, just for completeness sake, um, you know, just cause you're going to see that matrix in MATLAB just, uh, you know, just right now. Okay. okay. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into MATLAB. So let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay. okay. Okay, so this so this is a very simple example, and so I I, di I didn't really do too much with this, and so you can see here that I've defined my coefficient matrix A, okay, uh, and so you can see here that the coefficients here match should match what you have in, in your on your papers, okay, and this is for later. We'll go over that in a second, okay, and then you can see here I've defined my B vector, and the the B vector is what's shown in the uh, in the example, and so we have one in the first slot, zero point five in the last slot, and then everything else is zeros, okay. Okay, so that's just to find the matrices, and so here's and so here's kind of where the details of the um, of the solution actually come in. Okay, and so first we have this vector which we call sol next. Okay, and so you can see that this uh, this vector here is a zeros vector that is five five long, right? And so we have five entries here, and if you read the tooltip from this, you can see that it contains our solution at the next time step n plus one. Okay, so this is like phi n plus one. Okay, and then we also have sol cur. Uh, and this is our solution at the current time step. And so this is phi i at, at n. Okay. And then the next thing that we have here is the number of time steps that we want to solve for. And so in this case, I want to solve it for 25 time steps. And so I'm going to march this solution forward in time by, by 25. Okay. Let me go ahead and change this. Okay. okay. And so the way the time marching works is, is just like this. And so it's just a kind of a very simple for loop. And so we have four t step is equal to one to nt. Okay. And so you can see here that I'm repeating it nt times. Okay. And so in this case, I'm running this loop 25 times. And what I'm saying is that the, the next the next solution is equal to our uh, our coefficient matrix A multiplied by our current solution plus B. Okay. And then after we after we do that then um, then we set and we update the solution here okay and so what this is doing is we're updating our current solution okay and so what we're saying is that now that we solve for sol next now that one is known and so what we're saying is our sol cur which is our current solution is now equal to sol next okay and so all this is is just updating the solution to you know be what it what it is the next one all right, so let me run it. And so I, I have a couple more, I have a comment, another comment here, but we'll go through that in a second. Okay. So let me run it. Okay. And what do you see? Okay. And so you can see here that we, we have our graph here, um, you know, but if you look, if you look at the bounds on this graph, you can see here that it's six times 10 to the 27, okay? And uh, not only that, you see that the solution is jumping up and down. Right? And so what does that look like to us, right? And so we have, we have our numerical solution here that's jumping up and down and it's going to very, very high magnitudes. Right? And so this should remind you of what we saw in convection when we had unstable solutions. Right? And so this, this also is an unstable solution. Remember, you know, whenever you have, um, you know, your solution that's kind of jumping up and down a lot, and it seems to be growing in magnitude, then that's that's an unstable solution, and that's and that's what you don't want. Okay, and this highlights one of the big drawbacks of the explicit Euler method. Okay, and so if the explicit Euler method, one of the big drawbacks is that even though it's 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 probably the simplest time marching scheme that you can implement, uh, it has the danger of going unstable. Okay. Uh, and when it goes unstable, it does so pretty spectacularly. And so you can see that this is like six times ten to the twenty seventh, and so that's that's a massive number. Okay, so that's that's something that's not that's not normal. Okay. Uh, so any questions on on this so far? Is orange the true solution? 
No. So what I'm doing here is I'm plotting, I'm plotting each solution at different times. And so there's actually, there's actually a lot more graphs here. They're just, you're just impossible to see because this one's so big. You'll, you'll see when I get to the next step that uh, basically every time step I'm plotting the solution uh, again. Yeah. So this is, this is like a cheap, a cheap movie where you're kind of seeing all the frames kind of together at, at once. Okay. All right, so we, we have an unstable solution here. And so that's that's obviously you know not good. And so we don't we usually don't want to have an unstable solution. And so how can we fix this? Right. Um, so the way to usually fix uh, uh, fix these these kinds of issues when you have an unstable uh, solution is to remember when we did it in convection was to refine the grid, right? And so in other words, we made delta x, delta x smaller. Um, but for unsteady problems like this, um, usually what's more of a concern is not delta x, but delta t. Okay. Right. And so I think for this problem, I said delta t is equal to 0 0.1, I believe, right? Yes. Yes. And so for this, and so for these coefficients, I said delta t is equal to 0 0.1, okay? And so you can see with the with the uh, uh, with the time step size of a tenth of a second, we get an unstable solution. Okay? And so if you see an unstable solution like this, what you should do is you should reduce the time step size. Okay? And so I think for this next one, I set the dt is equal to zero point zero one. Okay. And so I reduced it by a factor of ten. Okay. okay. And so let's see what happens when I do that. And so I, I don't I don't have the derivation for it, but um, you know, what you can see here is I've defined another matrix here called A fine. And so A fine is basically the coefficients when DT is equal to 0 0.01, okay? And so let's go ahead, let's go ahead and uh, view that. Okay. So let me go ahead and run this. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the door. Okay. And so you can see here that you know when I when I set the um, the coefficients to the fine coefficients, we get a very different graph, right? Um, you know, instead, you know, we see a bunch of these lines, and they're not going unstable, right? Eventually, they they actually converge to you know to this kind of smooth curve on on top. And so that's good. And so the fact that we're not getting any uh, any unstable oscillations here means that you know we've reached a stable point, and this and this solution that we're getting is 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 good. Okay. And so that's the thing about explicit Euler is that you know you it's it's easy to implement. It's easy to solve for the uh, for the next time step, but you know you could go in state. And so that's that's something that you're always going to have to look out for. Okay. okay. And so what and so what do I mean that you know explicit Euler is easy to 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 implement? Okay. And so and so what I mean by that is that I'm referring to this kind of comment down here. Right? And so if you look at the code that we've written so far, you can see that none of it involved any kind of backslashing, right? And so backslashing, remember, was when we had to solve a linear system of equations. Right? Um, and so we don't have that here. And so we have just simple matrix multiplication and matrix and vector addition. Okay. By comparison, you know, if you compare matrix multiplication and vector addition with a with solving a linear system, this is like orders of magnitude a lot easier, right? Okay? Because uh, that's something you can do by hand, you know, pretty easily, right? And and we were actually doing that last time. And so last time we were actually performing the matrix vector multiplications, and we're doing the vectors additions, and and that's that's good, okay? And so you know, this is this is actually a huge huge benefit in terms of computation time because this. Because this operation, which we call a linear solve, okay, linear solves are traditionally very, very expensive compared to you know just matrix matrix multiplication, okay. And that problem becomes even worse, you know, once you get into higher dimensions as well. And so, if you can solve a problem, if you can if you can write a computational code without having to solve a linear system of equations. That normally is a huge advantage because that that allows you to skip a lot of lot of computations. Okay, and so you know, and so you know, I I see people in, in even in, in professional practice, I see people writing off explicit Eulers and or explicit methods 
you know, just because it can be unstable. Um, but you know, it's it's you know, you shouldn't just do that just because it's unstable because you know this 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 advantage is really a huge one right here. Okay, and it's really the only method that we've we've come up we've uh, we've gone over in this class that doesn't require linear salt. And so, um, actually, all the steady state stuff that we've been going over they all required a backslash or some kind of linear salt. And so, you know, the fact that this one doesn't is is you know is a big deal. The only thing you have to worry about is just unstable solutions, but you know, that also has it has its fix. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this code? All right, so this code's available for you online. And so if you go to the, uh, the Canvas site, in fact, I have the page open right here, and you go to our week seven page, this is the time stepping sample. So this is the first MATLAB script that I've, I've posted there. Okay. okay, so let's go back to the notes. Oops. So we can start talking about implicit work. Okay. okay. So actually, let me let me write that down. Explicit Euler. requires no linear solve. Okay. So this is a huge plus. Okay. But it can be unstable and so it can be unstable if delta t is, is not is not small enough okay okay so that's explicit euler and so that's the that's kind of the first one that that everyone learns um, and so now we're going to go over kind of the kind of the opposite of explicit Euler. Okay. And so if it, and so if explicit Euler is fast but unstable, then implicit Euler, Euler you can think of as expensive but stable. Okay. And so compared to explicit Euler, implicit Euler is a method for time marching. That is expensive, but um, most textbooks will tell you that it's always stable. Um, but there's, but there are ways to break even implicit oil and, and, you know, and I've done that sometimes too, but I'll say it's almost always stable. And the reason the reason we give it the same reason the reason we kind of attribute it to the same guy the same Euler is the method that we use to actually derive the equation is very similar to explicit Euler. Okay, and so the reason I, I kind of started today with this kind of three step process here is that implicit Euler follows almost exactly the same three step process. There's just one very key difference. Okay, and so let's let's go ahead and go over that that method. And so let's talk about the, the broad steps and then let's actually work on work on an example for that. Okay. okay. All right. So number one. And so let's if we go back to our, our, our notes up here. And so the first step is to discretize the time derivative with forward difference. Okay. And so that's going to be the exact same step here. And so just like before, we have partial phi partial t is equal to phi i n plus one minus phi i n divided by delta t, okay? All 
So that's not going to be too different because the, the idea for this is, is similar. And so, you know, the idea is to get expressions for to solve for phi i n plus one. And the primary way that we get phi i n plus one is to use this, this forward difference for this. Okay. Number two. Step two is to discretize all our spatial derivatives as before. And so all of our diffusion derivatives, convection derivatives, all of those get discretized the same. Uh, but here's the key difference. And so, you know, in explicit Euler, we assigned a, a time index of n to all of our phi terms. Here we're going to assign n plus one. Okay. And so as an example, here's our, here's our diffusion derivative, okay? okay. And so the difference here, you know, before we would, we would just assign all of these with just N, right? In order to get the implicit Euler, we're gonna assign these to N plus one. And so it, it's it's a simple change, and so it doesn't seem like much, um, but it's gonna it's actually gonna change our step three a bit too. Okay, and so in step three, in principle, it's the same. And so we're gonna have all the phi i n plus one terms on the left hand side of the equation. Okay. And then all the other terms are going to move to the right hand side. Okay. Notice how in here I said all n plus one terms, plural. Okay. And so in explicit order, we only had one n plus one, right? And so we, we just solved for it and that was our equation. But because we're assigning a lot more n plus one terms here, we're going to have more than just one as well. Okay. Okay, so here's here's kind of the general recipe, and so next we're going to actually go through go through the derivation for a one D problem. All right, any questions on 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 this? I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Uh, so on number one, it that's a delta t, right? Yes, yeah, it's delta that. t on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let's actually apply this to our to our conservation equation in one D. Okay. Okay. All right. So our conservation equation in one D, we have partial phi partial t is equal to minus u partial phi partial x plus k partial squared phi partial x squared plus q of x, okay? Okay, and so that's, and so that's just our differential equation. And so that's kind of what, that was, that's kind of our starting point, okay? Now we're gonna discretize, okay? And so let's apply step one and step two. So step one, we have phi i n plus one minus phi i at n, Divide by delta t okay, equal to minus u times, and I'm just going to use central difference for this just to keep it simple. Okay. okay. And just like I mentioned above, you know, we're going to assign a time index of n plus one for these uh, for these terms. Okay. 
there's our diffusion derivative, okay? And so just like the convection one, we're assigning them a time index of n plus one, okay? And then we also have Q of X, I. Okay. All right. And so I, I applied basically step one and step two um, together in this, uh, in this thing. So I just, I kind of did all the discretization at once, okay. All right, so in the next step, I'm going to multiply by delta T, and then I'm going to do apply step three, basically. Okay. Okay, and so if we do that, and so all of and so all of these terms right here, they're going to get shipped over to this side of the equation. Okay, and so I'm going to perform the algebra to do that, and then this phi I to the n, we're going to ship it over to the to the right hand side. Because remember, phi I at n is is known. Okay. And so if we do that, we end up with phi i n plus one. Okay, and so that's comes from the time derivative plus, and then I'm on all of this uh, convection term and move over, and so it's, this is going to be a plus u delta t divided by two delta x, okay, multiplied by phi i plus one n plus one minus phi i minus one n plus one. Right, then we have the diffusion term. And so we have a minus K delta T divided by delta X squared. So we have a minus because we have a plus on the right-hand side. And so when we move it to the left, it becomes a, a minus. Okay. And so that's everything on the on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we simply have B I at N plus Q at X I multiplied by delta T. And so once we have that expression, the, the next step is just to group all the like terms. And so all, we're going to group all the, the same coefficients for, you know, phi i plus one, phi i minus one. That's on the left-hand side. Okay. And we end up with the following. And so the following is going to be the last step. First, we have the phi i minus one and plus one term. Okay. okay. Then we have the phi i uh, and plus one term. Okay, then we have the phi i plus one n plus one term. Okay, so that's u delta t divided by two delta x minus k delta t divided by delta x squared. Okay, and then on the right hand side, we have phi i at n and then q x i at times delta t. Okay.
And so this equation that I've boxed here is, um, you know, the implicit Euler time marching equation um, for 1D for 1D conservation. And so this equation will work, um, you know, for for any 1D any 1D problem that has diffusion, convection, and the unsteady term. So it's a lot of terms I, I, I know, um, you know, but a lot of it's because you know, we left everything kind of in, in variables right now. Um, but in practice, normally you would plug in for, for all of these guys, um, you know, and get numbers for this. And that's what we're going to do for the next example. All right. Any questions on, on any of this so far? Okay. Okay, and so um, and so, what's the difference here? And so what's and so what's the big difference between this one and explicit Euler? Okay. And so the big difference is that if we look at the left hand side of our equation, we have multiple phi i n plus one terms, right? In fact, we have three of them. Okay. And so this is a problem because you know now now what we're saying is that you know we can't we can't solve for these uh, phi i n plus ones explicitly, okay? Um, and in fact, you know what this turns into this turns into a matrix set of equations, or it turns into a linear um, system of equations. Okay, and so if, and so if I were to put this in kind of um, symbolic form, you know, it would look like the following. Okay. And so the symbolic form for implicit Euler looks like the following, where again, A here is our um, coefficients matrix. Bi n plus one. This is a um, this is our solution at the next time step. Okay. Bi n. This is the solution at the current time step. And B here holds the same role. So B here is our vector of boundary conditions and source terms. And so our, our goal here is the same. And so, you know, you know, just like an explicit order, what we want to solve for is this phi i n plus one, okay? But the difference here is that it's not by itself. And so to actually solve for it, we have to take this matrix A, okay? We have to take this matrix A and invert it. And anytime you have, anytime a solution requires a matrix inversion, then what we have is a, is a um, linear system of equations, okay? And so our implicit Euler here is gonna be a lot more expensive because instead of just doing matrix vector multiplication, you know, now we're actually gonna have to do a linear solve. Okay? Uh, and that's expensive, okay? And, but, uh, but, you know, uh, we don't do all that extra work for nothing. And so what you'll see is that, you know, once, if we put the, if we put the solutions in this form, we're going to get something that's um, that's you know universally, almost universally stable. All right. Any questions on this before we we jump into an example? Okay. All right. So let's do let's do an example. Let me zoom in just to make these bigger. 
actually, let's do, we're going to do the same problem that we did before. And so our example here, we have um, partial phi, partial t is equal to three, partial squared phi, partial x squared, okay? Our boundary conditions are the following. And so just like before, our boundary condition at x equal to zero is going to be one. And we also have a Neumann condition at the other end. So you have part, um, d phi dx at x equal to one. And for all times t, okay? This is going to be equal to two. Okay. okay. And for this problem, we're going to make the following assumptions just to make our math a little bit easier. Okay. And so first, we're going to assume that our uh, we start with the zero initial condition. And so phi um, i at zero is equal to zero everywhere, okay? okay. We're gonna assume a time step size delta t of 0 0.1. And we're going to assume a grid, a physical grid spacing of 0 0.25. Okay, so that's going to be delta x. And we're going to use it. We're going to put this on a grid of five, five points. Okay, so these parameters are, are exactly the same as our last example. Okay, but as you recall, you know, as you recall, with delta t is equal to 0 0.1, this led to an unstable solution for explicit order work. Okay. And so we're using the same discretization parameters. Okay. And so we're using the same delta T, delta X. The only difference now is that we're using X implicit Euler instead of explicit. Okay. And what you'll see is that the extra work here is going to, is going to pay off, um, pay off well. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on, any questions on this? Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and start plugging in. Okay, since we, we since we already went through the trouble of, of, of deriving this equation, let's go ahead and, and plug into it. Okay. okay. And so to plug into this equation, we need to know the values of k and for u. Okay. And so for this problem, k, which is our diffusion coefficient, k is equal to three. Okay. And we also know the velocity. And so since, since this problem doesn't have any convection, and so there's no first order derivative for convection, we can set u is equal to, to zero. Okay. okay, and so if we plug these in to our equation, then we get the following. We get a minus 4.8 uh, phi i, minus one and plus one plus 10.6 bi and plus one minus 4.8 bi plus one and plus one. Okay. And we have no source term here. And so we don't have to worry about Q, but we do have a phi i and n. Okay. And so that's and so that's our evolution equation, and so that's our time marching equation for uh, for implicit Euler for this equation. Okay. Okay. So let's take this equation and let's apply it to the five nodes in our in our grid. Okay. And so our five nodes correspond to i is equal to excuse me, i is equal to one, okay? i is equal to two, i is equal to three, i is equal to four, i is equal to five, okay? Okay, so we apply this to i is equal to one, we have a minus 4.8, okay? Phi i minus one, so that's gonna be a phi zero and plus one 
plus 10.6 v1 n plus 1 minus 4.8 v2 n plus 1. Okay. This is equal to phi 1 at n. Okay. And then so on and so forth for, for the other ones. And so I'm going to write the other ones in, you know, fairly quickly. You know, but they they all kind of say the same thing. Oops. Almost done. Okay. There was a lot of writing, a lot of exponents, but uh, but that's what we end up. That's what we end up getting. Okay. Um, so not that different, right? And so you know, if you think back to when we were doing just purely spatial problems, so just purely diffusion or purely convection, you know, we had the same. We did the same thing, and so you know, we end up with a you know uh, with an equation that define the general the general general relationship okay and so that's what we have here okay by applying implicit Euler um, and then you know and then what we, once we have that then we apply that directly to the nodes in our, in our grid and so that's what we get um, with, with there. okay any questions on on this? Yes. So that's the next step. And so the next step is we need to we need to modify equations one and five um, for the boundary conditions. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we are allowed to have um, a node set uh, kind of like uh, the zero and the six. Oh no, we're not allowed to have those. And so we need that's why we need to get rid of those equations because we don't have node zero or, or node six. Um, but I wanted to show you just uh, you know. Um, for the different I values here, this is how we would apply it to all those those notes. But but we are going to get rid of the first one and the last equation just because we can't we can't apply those because there's no v zero doesn't exist and v six doesn't exist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So may, so maybe the more accurate way to say this was you know we apply this only for the interior nodes. Okay. So again, very similar to you know what we've done before. Okay, so now let's look at our two boundary conditions. Okay, and so we know we kind of know already that you know this first equation right here, you know we won't we're not going to be able to use this because phi zero doesn't exist. Okay, and this last equation we we're not able to use it because phi six does not exist. Okay, and so we need to replace those with the boundary conditions. Okay, and so let's look at let's look at our problem set up here. And so our first boundary condition is phi at x equal to zero, at all times t is equal to one. Okay. So this tells us that phi one is equal to one, okay? And then to make it kosher with the uh, with the implicit Euler, you know, we're going to set this equal. We're going to set the time index equal to phi i n plus one, okay? And so let's replace our first equation with that. Okay. And so our first equation now becomes phi one n plus one is equal to one. Okay. And then for the second boundary condition, we can, um, you know, we can use our finite differences just like before, okay? And so since this occurs at the right side of the domain, we're gonna have phi five minus phi four divided by delta x, in this case is equal to two, okay? <laughs> And so we're going to move delta x to the other side of the equation. And just like we did with the Dirichlet boundary condition, we're going to assign n plus 1 
to both of the phi terms, okay? So we have phi five, n plus one, minus phi four, n plus one, is equal to two delta x, okay? And since delta x here is 0 0.25, right? Then what we can say is that this is equal to two times um, 0 0.25, which is equal to 0 0.5, okay? And so let's go ahead and write that in for our last equation, our last equation here. Right, so for the last equation, we have a minus zero uh, phi four n plus one plus phi five n plus one is equal to zero point five. Okay. Right. And so now that we've applied our boundary conditions and we have all phi values here that are valid, and so we don't have any, uh, any invalid phi values, now we're ready to put this into matrix form, okay? And so in matrix form, this set of equations looks like the following, okay? And so we have a one, zero, 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 zero. Okay. Then we have a minus 4.8, 10.6, minus 4.8, 0, 0, 0 minus 4.8, 10.6, minus 4.8, 0, 0, 0, minus 4.8, 10.6, minus 4.8, okay. And then a 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, All that is equal to our vector of phi values. And so our vector of phi values is phi one through five. And this is all um, at the n plus one time index, okay? And then on the right-hand side, you know, we have a one right here. We have phi two at n, phi three at n, phi four at n, and then a 0 0.5. And so this is the matrix form of our five equations that we have above, okay? okay. Any questions on how we obtain these, uh, these matrices here? All right, and so to solve this, you know, just like before, you know, our goal is to solve for this, right? But since we have this um, big honk and tonk matrix on the left-hand side, you know, it's, it's not so simple anymore. And so we can't just do a matrix vector multiplication, okay? And so to solve this, you know, we have to do a matrix inversion here, okay? Uh, or we can just use MATLAB. Okay, and so we can use our magical backslash operator in MATLAB, okay, and that's going to do the same trick. Okay, and so let me show you what the equation looks like after one time step, okay. And so after one time step, we assume that our initial conditions are zero, okay. And so after one time step, we, we, uh, we solve this linear system and we obtain the following. And so we have phi one at n plus one is equal to one, okay? We have phi two, n plus one, this is equal to 0 0.8757, okay? We have phi three at n plus one is equal to 0 0.9339, We have phi four n plus one is 1.1867. Now we have phi five n plus one is 1.6867. Okay. 
So that's so that's the solution after just one after just one time step. Okay. And so you know, in, in order to proceed with this further, remember we usually don't just solve it for one time step. We keep marching this forward in time. Okay. And so after we solve for this, then we plug it into here. Okay. And then we use that to solve for the solution at the next time step. Okay. And we kind of just repeat this kind of over and over and over again. Okay. And so next I'm going to show you how it's implemented in, in MATLAB. But I want you to keep in mind that, you know, we use a delta T here of 0.1, right? That was our delta T here for this, um, for this equation. Remember for explicit Euler, you know, that delta T resulted in an unstable solution, okay? And so if, if implicit Euler is, is everything that's cracked up to be, then we can use the same time step size, but get a stable, a more stable solution. Okay, so any any questions on this before we, we jump into we jump into the MATLAB? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and jump in. Okay, so let me go ahead and share this screen again. Okay. Actually, I don't think I have this one downloaded. So this one you can find on the on the course website as well. Okay, so let me go ahead and download. Blazing fast internet. Okay. All right, so here's here's our implicit Euler code, okay? and so you can see here I've I've, I've defined our our uh, coefficient matrix by hand, okay? and so I have a one in the top left, and then we have all our negative four point eights and ten point sixes in their appropriate locations, okay? and I have the last row in the matrix, and then as well I also have our um, our b vector here, okay? and so the only the only things that we know for the b vector at first is that you know, we have a one in the top slot and a 0 0.5 in the last slot. Okay. And then just like last time, I have a uh, vector for this, uh, the, the next solution and a vector for the current solution. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So here, here we come to the time loop. And so this is, this is where things are going to be, things are going to be a bit different. Okay. And so the first thing you'll notice is that the, um, I have these three lines here to set B2, B3, and B4. Okay, and if you go back to if you go back to your notes, um, you know if you go back to our notes, you can see that the um, you know that our right hand side vector, the second slot was phi n at at our phi two at time step n, our third entry was phi three at time step n, and our fourth entry was phi four at time step n. Okay, and so what I'm doing here is I'm setting these values according to those to those current solution, right? And so B2, which is the second slot of our, of our right-hand side vector, this is equal to sole cur at two, okay? So that's gonna be phi two at N, okay? And same thing for three, same thing for four, okay? Okay, and so you can read the tooltip tells you the same thing. So this assigns the current solution values to the right-hand side vector, okay? This step here is really important because, um, you know, this is, this is how you basically update the time step uh, or update the current solution to make sure it gets factored into the next one, okay? And so we, we still do the same thing here, okay? So we still do the sole cur is equal to sole next, but in order to make sure that it actually gets factored into your solution, you have to do so here. Okay, and so here's here's where the big uh, uh, here's where the big um, difference is here. Okay, and so notice here that the the sole next the, the next solution is equal to a backslash b. Okay. It's a it's a very it's a very humble looking term, and so it doesn't look like it does that much. But remember, this backslash operator in MATLAB is for linear solves. Okay? And so what we're asking MATLAB to do is basically take this matrix A, invert it, and find its inverse, and then multiply it by the right-hand side vector B. Okay? And so that's what this, this does. And so this is going to plot it, and then finally we, we plot the solution. Okay? And, so if, and so if we, you know, if our theory is correct, then even with a time step of 0 0.1, we should have a stable solution. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. Okay. Right, it's it's a little bit hard to see because you know they they all end up lining up, you know. But you can see here that you know we start we start down here, right? Let me change the red. Okay. And so this right here is kind of close to our initial solution. And so if you actually if you actually measure these points, you'll see that they match exactly with kind of what what I showed in the in the notes. Okay. And then as we get as time goes on. We eventually converge to the steady state solution, which is this line right here. Okay. okay. 
And so that's good, right? And so, you know, we, we were basically able to achieve a, a stable solution. In this case, it's an accurate solution um, for a large time step size, okay? Um, and, so that's, and so that's the power of implicit Euler. And so with implicit Euler, you almost never have to worry about being unstable, you know, unless, unless you actually try to break it, which is, you know, which is very rare, um, but, you can, but you can break almost anything if you try. Um, and so, um, you know, but for most practical situations, you never have to worry about instability. The downside, and, and, it's, and it's really hard to appreciate in 1D because it, it all happens so fast. The downside is that this, uh, this, this step right here, okay, the step where we, where we perform the linear solve, a backslash b, this is a lot more expensive. Okay? And so you're gonna spend a lot more time just kind of waiting for the code to churn waiting for it to compute, uh, you know, before you can actually get a solution. It becomes a lot more apparent in 2D than it is for, for 1D. Okay. And so next we're gonna do, we're gonna learn how to do, uh, you know, explicit Euler in 2D. And that's where you kind of, that's where you start to see a big difference between the explicit and implicit Euler. Okay. For implicit, for, for, for 1D, you know, implicit Euler is, is you know, it's, it's more expensive, but it's only more expensive by like a quarter of a second, maybe. And so you don't really notice it, but um, you know, but trust me, trust me when I say it, it is, it is actually more expensive. Uh, okay, any questions on, on this? Yeah, so it converges to the steady state solution and that solution is the true solution. Yes, yeah, in that case, in this case, that is the, that is the true solution for this one. Uh, so we, so, you know, that's, that's a good point to bring up. And so, you know, at this point, you know, we've, we've basically been solving steady, steady problems in an unsteady way. Okay. Uh, we haven't, we haven't done any cases where, you know, either the parameters of the problem are changing with time uh, or what's more common is that the boundary conditions are changing with time. And so um, that's something that we're going to do next week. And so, you know, what, what if, so if I were to play this as a video, what you'll see is that a bunch of lines just start showing up here. Okay, and then and then they all just kind of converge onto this one line right here. Okay, which is fine. You know, I, I think that's that's not bad. But it's kind of boring, right? And so if we're going through this trouble of, of of making a code that solves unsteady problems, we should have some things here that change with time. Okay, and so what we're going to do next week is that I'm going to do a boundary condition where actually this this value here is going to change with time, and you'll actually get to see you know a video of your solution. It's going to look like a wiggling string. And so you know, as you can imagine, you know, you have a string. It's kind of tied to a wall, and we're kind of, kind of, we're going to vibrate it up and down, and you can, you can see the string kind of wiggle, and the waves kind of travel down, down the string. So that's, that's what we're going to do next week. Okay. But today, but you know, for this week, since we're still just kind of learning the theory, this is the first time we've done unsteady problems, and so I'm doing kind of pseudo, pseudo steady. Okay, and I'm using it just to kind of show you that this, that this solution is, is stable, basically. Okay, all right. So let me go ahead and stop this. So we have we we only have about five minutes left, but I think it, it's still worth it to kind of start the, the next step. Okay. And so the next step is to um, basically talk about how we can apply this methodology in 2D. Okay. And we're going to start with explicit order. Okay, and so in 2D, you know, 2D, 2D, uh, much doesn't really change. Um, you know, the only thing that really changes is that you have to do just more computations, okay? And so we're gonna follow the same recipe. Okay, same recipe as before. The only thing is that you know there's just more to do because there's more derivatives and more more terms to flip. Okay, the nice thing about time is that there's there's no such thing as two dimensional time, um, you know at least not at least not in this time time space plane, um, and so you know we don't have to worry about making the time multi dimensional. It's just the spatial parts that are multi, and and that we've that we know how to do. And we've we've done that before. Okay.
All right, so let's uh, so let's um, list out our general conservation equation. Okay, so our oops. And so our general conservation equation looks like the following. Okay, so we have partial phi, partial t plus u partial phi partial x plus v partial phi partial y is equal to k partial squared phi partial x squared plus partial squared phi partial y squared okay plus qxy So this is kind of a, a nice moment in this class, and that's kind of the reason why I want to push, you know, until the end here. Because if you if you look back to our kind of our notes from the very first week, you know, this is the equation that I gave you, right? So this is our general conservation equation. This is our general heat equation, um, general mass transfer equation. Um, and up until this point, we've kind of been slowly kind of building things up, and so we've kind of been adding terms one at a time. But for the first time ever in this class. The gang is all here, right? And so we can finally solve everyone together at the same time, which is kind of a nice, a nice thought. Okay. Okay. And so the first step, um, an explicit Euler, uh, we have we're going to do step one, step two together. And so we're going to discretize all our derivatives. So let's start with the time derivative. And so remember for the time derivative, we always apply um, forward difference for that. Okay? And we're gonna do that in time. Okay. All right, and so that's our, um, that's our time derivative. But since we're in 2D now, we have two spatial indices. And so we have both I and J. So we have phi I comma J at N plus one minus phi I comma J at N divided by delta T. Okay. okay, next we have the convection derivatives. And just for simplicity, I'm gonna use central difference for this. Okay. And so we have phi I plus one comma J minus phi I minus one comma J divided by two delta X, okay. And just like uh, in true explicit Euler format, we're going to evaluate these at time index n. Okay. Then we have the y convection. Okay, so y convection is um, j plus one j minus one. Okay, and again, all of that's evaluated at time step n. Okay. Then we have the x derivative diffusion. Okay, then we have the Y diffusion. Okay. And then finally, we have the source term. So the source term will just say Q, I, comma, J. Okay. All right, it's a lot of terms. It's, it's a lot of indices, I know. And it's, uh, you know, it becomes kind of a, an, an alphabet soup of, of, of I's and J's and N's, okay? All right, and so we're gonna stop here for today because you know going any more beyond this would require more time, but um, you know we're gonna proceed just like before. And so you can see here for, because it's explicit, you know, we only have one phi, we only have phi one, uh, only one phi N plus one, okay? And so we're gonna manipulate this equation to solve for this. And once we do that, you know, we'll have an explicit formula to solve for phi i n plus one that depends on a bunch of phi i n's. Okay. And so same process we followed in one D is just there's just more to do because it's, it's more terms. But but in principle, it's the same it's the same process as before. Okay. All right. Any final questions on this before we wrap it up for today?
Okay. All right. So that's it for today. And so remember, Wednesday is our midterm. And so make sure you are uh, you're here because uh, there's no uh, there's no plans to offer the exam virtually. Okay. Um, there's no MATLAB on the there's no MATLAB on the exam. And so you know, remember the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is to discretize the equations. Okay. So very similar to problem two on homework three. Um, and then you can expect the solutions for homework three to be up uh, tonight. Okay. All right, so thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I know it's always tough, you know, the, the class session before the midterm, uh, but I appreciate you guys coming out. So have a, hope you guys have a great evening. Uh, if you have any questions before the midterm, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know, I'll be available through email and I have office hours tomorrow morning as well. Okay. And so I'll see everyone. I'll see everyone in person on, on Wednesday. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you, Tran. Thanks again, Dr. Tran. Thanks, guys. Is this for problem two B on the on the homework? Yeah. Uh, oh, so you're saying you're getting a lot bigger numbers than than mine? So I I know the bigger number. I just wanted to tell the third class here. The third class here. Right. I so um, I find the solution. Yeah. It means like the third number was the the same and the is different for different coefficient. I see. Even when you multiply by delta squared, it's different. Uh, yeah. Is it for is it for all of them or just or just the one? For all oh, disease. So all the ones that are one hundred. Yeah. yeah, all the ones. Okay. Um, yes. So that one hundred here is P two. So that's right, because your 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 bottom neighbor should just be four divided by the square, right? Because it doesn't make any contribution from the from the Oh these ones, these ones you should use because you're using a forward difference on this. Um, you should try to be consistent between the two. So even though even though this part will be stable because the velocity is only five, um, if you're going to use a upwinding scheme for this, you should use an upwinding scheme for that. So, so you mean I, uh, this one I use the forward uh, central difference. And this one, this one you should use backward distance because the velocity is constant. Oh, so you mean I can produce one one number is not stable both exactly yeah so right. both strong. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's to keep it consistent, just so that you have the same order. Um, but I mean, this I mean that should affect this. And so, can you? Uh, I'd have to look at it a little bit more closely with, with like a calculator. So can you can you scan this and then send me an email and then I'll I'll take a look to this. Oh, and also for the for the like the other yeah, yeah. yeah. For equation that we in the test, we need to list all these. Mm -hmm. Like in the test, we need to list all these. Uh, all these, all these. So, the, so the test will tell you. And so it'll say, you know, just give me, usually I just ask one. So for the exam, you know, I'll give you a domain like this. So give me one example of boundary conditions for the top. And so you just choose either 14 or 15. Oh, so I, I, can, I don't need to do all the. Right. Yeah. Because then because then that just becomes a writing exercise. And then that's, that's too much writing. Mm -hmm. So. If you just give me one example for that, I think that's that's enough. So each one like this one, this one, this one, each each time like this exactly. one. Yeah. Oh, oh that's I see. Oh, it's yeah. Yeah, send me send me an email and then I'll I'll check your work. Oh, okay. yeah. mm -hmm. Any final questions from 417 before I, I close up the call? Kind of blurry, huh? Okay, uh, so I got to go run to another class, so I'm going to go ahead and close it. But uh, um, if you have any other questions, just uh, just shoot me an email. Okay. All right, thanks, guys.